Hey everyone, uh, I'm Eve. Uh, I'm the CEO of Fieldwire, and I'm here today with uh, Scott Karinsky, the Executive Vice President of Bear Construction, uh, a GC in the Chicago area, Illinois. And of course, I have Ray with me, our, our Head of Marketing. Uh, Scott, we're, we're huge fans of Bear. Uh, we love to have you as a customer. We love the work your team is doing on, on, on landmark projects such, such as the, the old Chicago Post Office. Um, we'd love to talk more about that today, but we're going to keep the conversation more focused on uh, what's happening right now in the news, which is COVID-19 and uh, what you're seeing and what you're able to do to, uh, to alleviate some of the effects that it's having on the company. Um, we, had a, we had another contractor uh, from Chicago on on uh, on, on the show, Tim Pickett from uh, Encompass AV, and uh, as a specialty contractor, they're already pretty impacted in terms of volume by by COVID nineteen. How are you guys doing right now? Uh, are you still able to work? What's the situation? Right now, we haven't seen any direct uh, jobs being canceled or suspended. We've got a couple clients who put some jobs on very temporary hold, but I'm told those are starting up again. So for the most part, knock on wood, we've been pretty fortunate and most of our clients and uh, contractors have continued letting us work. So as far as any direct impact on us, it's been limited. Uh, we have had some subcontractors who have um, chosen not to come to work and honor the stay at home rules that the governor issued. Uh, and that's having some impact on some of our jobs right now. Okay. Uh, so my understanding is that uh, construction is still essential in the state of Illinois. And so regardless of type of project, you're allowed to continue work? Uh, there's some ambiguity there. I mean, if you really read the governor's order, and I think most of the states, I've looked at Ohio and Michigan, some of the other ones, uh, Illinois is, is calling construction essential work as relates to healthcare, infrastructure, public safety, things like that. They don't explicitly say that tenant build outs, you know, for a tenant's conference room downtown Chicago is essential business, but they're not saying it's not. So most contractors are choosing to work. Most of the workers themselves want to continue to work because they need a paycheck. Um, so the ones that, you know, do want to interpret it that way are doing so, as I would say 75% are. Uh, the remainder are choosing to honor it as what they think it is and that their work is not essential. So you've got subcontractors like tile setters and that not across the board, but some individual companies on our side that have chosen yep. to not have their, their people work. So let, let's imagine for a second that the language gets clarified and a portion uh, of the industry has to go to a forced shutdown. Is that an eventuality you're preparing for? Uh, do you have a contingency, contingency plan in place? We are. Um, you know, it's very complicated because if they do force us to shut down, we've still got deadlines and contracts that have end dates that we have to meet. And until those contracts are amended or the government says that we don't have to honor them, we've, we've got to get those jobs done. Uh, what I think is going to happen, you know, just watching things develop over day by day, um, we're having more and more buildings where there is a confirmed case at one property that might be a 50 story office building and they have to evacuate two floors. And all those workers have to go home and stay home until the place is cleaned and, and sanitized. Um, you know, and so far, that's all been a one-off case. We've got one confirmed case. And then everyone mm -hmm. cleans. They go back to work two days later. But what happens when it's another worker three days after that? And then, you know, two days after that, or it's four workers on a site. So I think eventually, if, if the numbers keep playing out like we think they're going to, you're going to get to a point when it's almost it's impossible to keep up with the cleaning and the job shutdowns. And I think at some point as contractors collectively, we're going to have to make the decision to suspend work. If it gets to that, we're all hoping it doesn't and that, you know, things continue to kind of come up one at a time and we can deal with them. Mm -hmm. And I just have a feeling like, you know, like you're seeing in New York right now, we're going to get overwhelmed eventually and you won't be able to keep up with the cleanup and in the, you know, contingency plans. Are you hearing from uh, New York contractors that they're, they're, they're halting work right now on most jobs? I haven't directly. Uh, we've got some clients in New York and they've told us that it's very similar to Chicago thus far where, you know, we're having something come up in one building at a, at a one-time thing and then mm -hmm. they come in clean and we go back to work or they go back to work. And thus far, that's what they're seeing. That's what we're seeing here. But, you know, watching the news, the, the cases there, you know, really starting to skyrocket. And I think as they become more widespread, we're going to have issues across the board. Okay. I mean, you mentioned like sanitizing website, uh, sanitizing sites uh, and, and maybe uh, communicating uh, specific protocols to, to specialty contractors. Like, 
what what are you effectively doing to to kind of like limit the spread and just make sure your sites are as safe as possible? Uh, well, first and foremost, we've we put up signage at every job site, you know, indicating the the spread of the disease, how to avoid it, you know, the symptoms to look for. We've added hand sanitizing stations to every possible location on every job we have. Uh, the hand, it, you know, implementing the hand washing stations everywhere. Um, we're limiting break time, you know, telling the guys that they can't take break clustered in, in big groups. They have to, you know, stay separated like the rules are asking for. Um, we're staggering shifts going into elevators. If we have, you know, 20 people to go up into a job site at 6 a.m., we're asking it be two or three at a time and they're just taking turns going up the elevator, not getting, you know, 10 in the elevator at one time. Um, you know, those are the biggest steps with subcontractors and on our job sites. Uh, a lot of it's just awareness, you know, spreading the, the word to our, our people and our contractors. Gotcha. I mean, we've, uh, we've heard uh, stories of, uh, of, of, of GCs doing rotating lunch breaks between trades so that mm -hmm. they, they, they get their own tables and things like that. Uh, that makes sense from a, from a pure productivity perspective, like like what what level of productivity are you able to continue work right now? Are we talking fifty percent? Are we talking eighty percent? I'd say closer to eighty. I, I actually spoke to a couple of my superintendents this morning, and we are you know we're definitely seeing some labor sh not shortages. I don't want to say that some labor deficiencies where if a crew had you know ten people that should be on a job, they might have eight that actually show up to work, and the other two choose to stay home. So we're definitely getting some some shortages of manpower. Uh, in those regards, but nothing that's really affected any jobs uh, from moving ahead yet. So I would say okay. we're probably 80 to 90% efficient right now. All right. And if you had to look at the, basically the attendance of uh, specialty contractors, like the one that are showing up versus the one that are preferring to be safe uh, and, and not send uh, some of their uh, craftsmen on site, what, what's the proportion right now? Uh, I would say it's about the same. It's probably 80 to 90%. We've only had a, a very few, and most of those that we've had that have, uh, I'll say, walked off a job or, you know, decided not to come to a job have been in response to an event. So, for instance, we okay. had a building where last Saturday, actually at the old post office, that uh, we had a confirmed case, and the, the building and everyone there took all the right steps and, and got everything cleaned and, and sanitized. But you know the rumor mill started circulating, and you, there's 800 to 1,000 workers in that building between us and the other GCs yeah. that are working in site. So, it doesn't take long for rumors to get blown out of proportion, and you know pretty soon the whole building is locked down, and people don't know what they're doing, which none of which was the case. But uh, so Monday there was a lot of uncertainty with the trades, and we had a very low attendance. But then once we were able to get in front of the situation and the building, and we all put out you know our our memos to everyone that's stating that. You know, we're taking the right steps. The building's been clean. We've identified the, the infected person. Yeah. Uh, then Tuesday rolled around, and we were back up to what I would say, you know, pretty normal attendance again. So Monday, everybody was scared, uh, didn't know what was going on. And then once we informed them what actually is going on and, you know, that it is safe to go back to work, they're coming back. Yeah, hey, Scott, that's a good segue to a question, you know, speaking of subcontractors, a question that keeps coming up, and it's a conversation we've had multiple times, including on the town hall, is that since things are changing so quickly, you know, there are things changing by the hour sometimes in certain cities. What recommendations would, would you have to other general contractors around the country of how they can better communicate with their subcontractors about those changes and about your recommendations? Um, we use a software called Pipeline that we communicate all our bid platforms through with our subcontractors. So every one of our subcontractors, specialty contractors is in our pipeline system. So we issued a statement actually on Monday uh, relative as a response kind of to this case I just mentioned. Uh, through that platform that goes out to all thousand of our vendors, every one of them gets it and we get a confirmed receipt if they read it or if it's in their mailbox unopened. Uh, and then they can respond to that through pipeline or directly to us. So that's, that's how we've chosen to do it just because it, it hits, it blankets everybody at one time. Um, in specific buildings where there are Exposures. We just had a new one this morning at another building. Um, we've, in that case, we're going directly to those eight or twelve subs that are on that job, and just communicating via email or phone, depending on what the case may be. And what kind of information do you think? Is that one of the things we're we're hearing because this is unprecedented, so a lot of GCs hadn't really thought about how to respond in a situation like this. What things would you say like 
really you should come up with a plan to make sure that you're communicating. What are those top three things that need to be communicated regularly to their subcontractors? I think first they want to know that you're actively monitoring the situation. So we want to keep communicating to them that we as Bear Construction, as the owners and leaders of this company, we are actively talking every day, listening to news outlets, talking to industry peers, clients, trade organizations, the unions about you know what their stances are and everything. So A, that we're on top of things and in control. Uh, B, they want to know what procedures we're taking to make our job site as safe as possible. And that goes back to the hand washing stations and the signage and toolbox talks with our crews every day or every other day to discuss, you know, this situation. Um, you know, so they want to know what we're doing to protect them. And then they also want to know what, know what to do themselves. And we're trying to give them guidance, you know, based on the CDC guidelines and what those best experts are telling us to do and kind of pass that on to them. Um, and then the fourth thing is probably what, you know, what our protocols are in the event of an exposure or a confirmed case. And we've got all four of those things we're trying to communicate with them, you know, as often as possible. What are, what are toolbox talks that, that, that sounded like, a, it sounds like a bear branded uh, thing. I, I wish it was. No, it's, it's okay. kind of an industry wide thing. Uh, just, you know, typically they re regard safety and, and job site uh, means and methods. So usually once a week, our superintendents or our safety officer goes out to the job gathers all the trade workers on that job site and they talk about a topic and then, you know, they rotate topics through the crews through the year. But the last three weeks, it's all been COVID-19. Good. Um, I mean, I think there are really two big questions. If I'm a, if I'm a specialty contractor right now working on, on, on a job site is how do I keep uh, my craftsmen and, and women and my technicians safe? Uh, and I think we, we talked about that uh, extensively so far in, in this discussion. There is the other side, which is how do I keep the company healthy while my volume may be affected, right? right. Um, and so what are you seeing? Are you having uh, different con conversations with, with your subs, with sometimes your owner maybe to make sure that we keep the cash, uh, the cash flow going well so that in, in, I don't know, four to six weeks, maybe when, when this thing starts to ease up, we don't have half the specialty subs on, a, on, on the job site going bankrupt, right? That's a very important point. And one of the first things we started considering beyond the safety of ourselves and our crews was our cash flow and, and keeping the company in a good position through this. Uh, and that translates to our subcontractors. So uh, very early on, and, you know, as, as long ago as three weeks ago, when this was all kind of really hitting the fan, um, our ownership really made a conscious effort to uh, get in contact with all of our clients, especially those with any past due receivables and start pushing those receivables. Uh, we're also making a huge push on our end with our people to get our, our billings in uh, as promptly as possible. Um, so that if there's any type of slowdown in payment, it, it's not as bad as uh, it could be if we waited. Um, and likewise with the subs, we're really making sure that they're not um, over billing us or forward billing us because there there is a little bit of panic out there and people are starting to watch their cash flow. So we've already seen some subs try to kind of, you know, they're the first week of a job and they're billing us 80% for the job. So we're really trying to watch what they're billing us. We're trying to protect them by staying in contact with our owners and billing promptly and to chase the old receivables that uh, we still have out there. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I didn't uh, actually think about the, the problem of, of potentially overbilling to prepare for a very, very extended cash period, which would be a, uh, very toxic down the line for the for the project. Right. Right. Um, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. In general, my perception though is that a, a two to four week cash interruption for for specialty contractors is a lot harder to endure than for GCs. Like, what are the horizons where you think that that cash flow really becomes a problem for you? Yeah, I think you know it's it's going to depend on every business individually. But I think in general, the bigger the firm, you know, the better you can ride out these types of events. Um, like a lot of restaurants and other small businesses that are going to hurt really bad, some of the small contractors are going to be in that same position. You know, and I've um, talked to a couple of communications vendors who all their work is downtown, similar yeah. to the person who was on the the town hall yesterday with you guys. Uh, and you know, a lot of their work is just canceled because the bars aren't operating the conference rooms aren't operating. There's just no, nowhere to put their, their product. Um, so That's those fair. people are going to feel it more than, than us as a GC, you know, we're all going to feel it, but they're the smaller, the company, I think the worse it's going to be. 
that makes sense. Scott, it's pretty impressive. Like you guys seem to have like a really good plan in place. And you mentioned from a safety perspective that you're relying on the CDC for information. What are, what are the other sources of information you guys are counting on right now to make sure you stay, stay on top of this as much as you can? Uh, well, we all, we watch the daily briefings with our governor and our president. Um, every day I watch the news, you know, just about 24 hours a day. Uh, we're talking a lot to our industry peers, our competitors. Um, you know, it's amazing. We've, a lot of competitors have come together in this time and really are talking about how to protect ourselves as a whole, not just as an individual company. So we're talking with them. Uh, we're watching what clients are doing, reacting to, you know, their announcements and their procedures. And it's really a work in progress. And, you know, we, we've amended our policy about four times now in the last week and a half um, based on new information from all those sources. Wow. Great. Well, Scott, thanks for the great, uh, extremely focused information. I think uh, what I'm remembering is uh, communicate well, talk to, uh, talk to the other companies in your sector, adapt to the situation frequently. It seems that you guys have amended your, your policies uh, quite a lot and, and just uh, stick together for, uh, for the next few weeks until this is over. It pretty well sums it up. Very good. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Scott. Bye-bye.